up. There he is, the man himself. That needs no introduction, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Stephen. Very good. Thank you, Kelly. Great to be back with everybody again today. Uh, really excited about uh, the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about three-dimensional instruction. Now, we've been talking about this for a long time. I mean, the framework for K-12 science education came out. Uh, Next Generation Science Standards came out, um, and I hope that most of you know about that. I'm going to do just because I have unfortunately found that there are still folks who don't uh, have not really heard a whole lot about it. So I'm going to start my presentation. I'm not going to go into depth, so please don't start checking your email and 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 texting people yet. This this is actually um, a, uh, a a just a very brief. Uh, intro in case people haven't seen it before. So feel free to tweet me uh, at Dr. Spruitt, uh, you know, if you, if you would like. Uh, I didn't point that out when I spoke the other day, but uh, feel free to do that. Love hearing from people. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about this value of science. Um, you know, why I'm not going to go through my presentation that I did the other day, but I do want to just really start by saying we as a society have got to figure out that the value of, of STEM and the value of science is not just because people like talking about atoms, protons, uh, mitosis, and, and uh, Pluto. It's actually because if we're really going to be able to continue to compete in an international market, citizens of the U.S. are going to have to be science and STEM literate. Um, th there's no doubt about that. But, it may, but I also think that we're in a place where we have to think about it differently. Uh, I, I mentioned this in my presentation the other day. We're in the fourth industrial revolution. And so knowing about science, not just the facts, but how we think, how we process, and how we integrate information is really important. So STEM, to me, doesn't have periods. In other words, it's not S period, T period, E period, M period. It's STEM. It's integrated. It's how we should think about it. In fact... You know, we should be able to think about integrating science within reading. Um, now, a lot of people say that and people get nervous because they think that we're saying just go read a bunch of books about butterflies and you'll be good. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you really can't get deeply into understanding the science without having some background knowledge, without having some vocabulary. Now, unfortunately, we turned science into a word wall many years ago and it became just about the vocabulary. What 3D learning is about is really about the processing and about how do we think about science and how does science change. We know from the National Research Council that reading, interpreting, and producing text are fundamental practices in science. In particular, they constitute at least half the engineers and scientists' total work time. So we've got to recognize that that's an issue. We need to remember that how we integrate science and math. We can't possibly think about science without knowing how to analyze and interpret data, without looking for the patterns in the data, actually developing models and making predictions based on those models. Those things can happen in math and in science, and actually if they're done together, they're done really powerfully. We know that there's a lot of things that overlap. If you think about the practices that we have, we think about um, how in science we ask questions, define problems, construct explanations, in ELA, we're reading, writing about complex texts. In math, we're making sense of problems and reasoning abstractly. But here's the thing. All three, we're going to argue from evidence. All, you know, and then there's an interplay in here between analyzing, interpreting data and developing and using models with math. There's the find, evaluate, and communicate information that, that overlaps with ELA. So STEM and science in and of itself, we have to think about this differently if we're really going to help our students can, to really be good and, and contributing members of society. Now, again, I think everybody knows this, and I hope you do, So I want to, but I'm just going to run through this really quickly. When we talk about three-dimensional science, we're talking about scientific and engineering practices, the cross-cutting concepts, and the disciplinary core ideas in the sciences. So, the way I think about it is, um, you know, the science and engineering practices is, is how scientists collect and communicate information. The cross-cutting concepts, you know, they're really the objective lens. 
they're, they're how we think about it. They're how we connect it to other things. But it also brings a greater focus on, on what we're talking about. And, of course, the disparate core ideas are it's the stuff. It's the, the, the biology, the chemistry, the physics, the earth, and the engineering. But I am going to just take a very quick pause here, and, and I want to really reemphasize the cross-cutting concepts. I'm going to talk about them more, but this unifies what we think about with science. Think of this. If you put a bottle of cold water on a desk and you want to think about and you want your students to think about why is it condensing on the outside? Now, this is something that can be done in K5, 6, 8, 9, 12. The disciplinary core ideas tell you the differences in the depth that your kids should know. But here's what's cool about cross-cutting concepts. You can almost think of them as the objective lens on a microscope. So when you're looking at that at the condensation on, on the bottle. You can think about structure and properties of matter, and that's a content thing. But how do we connect it? Well, if you look at, at the cross-cutting concept, it could be about matter. And you can have kids focus on just the matter. Where did those water droplets come from? You could actually have them use the cross-cutting concept of energy and think what had to happen for energy for there to be enough water to come together to stick to the outside of that bottle. You could actually even think about um, cause and effect. You could, you know, so what happens is the, the cross-cutting concepts allows you to focus and allows you to, to, to go into a place where you're able to really focus completely and totally on, um, on actually what you're, you're focusing on. And, if, and actually the cool thing is, if you, if you also uh, look at multiple cross-cutting concepts at one time, you actually are thinking about it almost like a, com uh, a compound lens. You're seeing way more than what you have seen in the past. So it, it's really a, a pretty incredible thing. Uh, it, it gives us the, an opportunity to think about uh, how we uh, operate, uh, as to how we um, uh, think about the, the, the work and, and how the phenomenon itself works. Now, a good friend of mine, Brett Molding, put together this idea of gather, reason, and communicate. This is actually a, a great way to start thinking about how do we start to, to plan instruction and how do we put these things together? So if you look at the science and engineering practices, having students be able to gather information, meaning they obtain it, they ask questions, they plan and carry out investigations, they use mathematics and computational thinking, they use models. Within reasoning, they evaluate information, they analyze data, they use math, they construct explanations, they continue to develop arguments on, on, for why or, or how based on evidence, uh, they support explanations, they use models to predict. And, uh, and finally, there's communication. That's a big deal. Um, in fact, I think that's the one that we tend to, to lose on a lot because we think we're communicating by simply turning it in. This is also where students should be able to, com to communicate their arguments. They should be able to think about the written or oral, uh, in both written and oral forms. They should talk about how that evidence supports the explanation. And they should use their models to really communicate their reasoning. Uh, this is actually from uh, Going 3D with GRC. It's a book from Brett Moley. I'm going to be sharing with you in a moment an instructional strategy that's based on this, so I wanted to share that with you. Now, across cutting concepts, here's an example of how San Diego County actually approached it, which I think is really cool. They think about the cross-cutting concepts in terms of patterns, causality, and systems. Again, you can use any one of these or any multiples of these, but it allows you to bring a greater focus and allow students to really connect phenomena of things that they see in the world to what they're actually doing in, in, uh, in the classroom. And I, I think that that's just really, really important. Of course, our disciplinary core ideas, this is uh, you know, something that's pretty uh, standard we, we see this as, um, uh, you know, life sciences, earth space, and physical. But for the first time under the framework, we also added engineering and technology. 
So now here's the thing. And, and, and as a former state superintendent or state commissioner of education in Kentucky, I can tell you, I've seen a lot of science instruction. Um, and I still see where people think about the, about these three areas and they think three dimensional performance is what happens or three dimensional learning is actually what happens when I do a lab. And then I do a lecture on content and hopefully they figure out that there's something about cross-cutting concepts that connect. But the reality is, uh, and this is where the Concord cons Consortium put together this kind of schematic. Um, what really means are these three things have to be operating together. In fact, the reality is that when we think about uh, how this works, we think about um, explaining phenomena using the practices to explain the core ideas and then making connections with the cross-cutting concepts. It's really, really critical, I think, that people see that and they see how this, how that actually works. Now, SREB, Southern Regional Education Board, where I am, we are an organization that supports education throughout the South. And we have had a history of working a lot with math and literacy. And in thinking about math and literacy, you know, we've done a lot of good work. Um, frankly, we've seen where there's a lot of uh, important things that are happening. But at the same time, uh, we've not gone quite as far as I think that we should have with um, around the areas of science and social studies and some other things. Well, for those of you who may have been around a while and you may have seen me before, um, you probably know that wherever I've gone, we ultimately end up doing science. Um, I think that, that not just because I'm a science guy, but because I really think that this is a really important thing that we see and that we show. Um, and so we are now gonna be launching more into uh, the ideas around science. So in thinking about this, we've developed powerful science instructional practices. Now, and this is not to be confused with the science and engineering practices. This is about the instructional practices themselves. What does it mean to really implement 3D learning? And actually, I wanna go back here and make one more clarity here. Notice I've talked about three-dimensional performance. The, in the NGSS, we talk about performance expectations. In the framework for K-12 science education, they, they push this idea of performance expectations. Though that term was not chosen lightly because it's not about what the teacher does. It is really and truly about what the student does and what, how the student approaches it. So what I wanna to introduce to you is based on the GCR model, uh, I'm sorry, GRC model that, that I talked about earlier, Brett uh, actually helped us develop this. And this is a way to think about how you might go about really implementing 3D performances in your classroom. So this is the cycle. There are basically eight steps. Um, and these are things that you would consider as you are thinking about developing your instruction. First of all, making sense of natural and human design phenomena. You need to know that whenever I talk about phenomena, it could be natural, it could be man-made or human design. Um, we're, I'm not going to make a distinction in phenomena because kids should be able to do both. Um, and so here we're going to present students with a phenomenon and have them start to make sense of it. You can do this in many ways. You can use claim evidence reasoning and, and revisit that over time. You can have them begin to think about it in different ways from the outset, but you want to get them engaged with it. Kids want to know, why do I care about learning this? This is actually a great way to do that. Second thing is developing questions to plan and carry out investigations, design solutions, and or obtain information. Um, so you want kids to think about making sense of the phenomena, but then what kind of questions are they going to need to do? How are they going to use those questions to plan and carry out investigations? That's important because a lot of times we hand kids the cookbook labs we want kids to be driving the questions. And so, and, and sometimes we have kids do their own design, but if they, but they just kind of start. In fact, I've even seen adults do that. And I'm gonna show you an activity in a minute where, where that happens quite a bit. You've gotta have kids start getting into the mindset of what questions am I really gonna to need to think about as I carry out an investigation, as I plan and carry out an investigation or as I design a solution. 
And what type of information do I need to obtain to really uh, justify the questions or the answers to the questions I produce? Gathering data, uh, inf information to use in developing evidence. Remember, data is just points. Information, just information. It's not until you apply reasoning that you start to see evidence. So reasoning how the evidence supports explanation for the causes of the phenomena, that's the fourth step. It's really important that kids actually start to think about how all this fits together. Now, then we want kids to engage in academic discourse. We want them to be able to argue. We want them to be able to debate. Um, they should be looking at one another's data and having conversations about what they're seeing around the phenomena and how their model works. We know that models, you know, I'm gonna use a, a phrase that many of you have come to expect me to use. You know, models are important and models change based on new evidence. And models can predict future events based on the evidence that you have. They aren't things that you can eat. In fact, I've said before, if you can eat it, it's probably not a model. Uh, it's more of a representation. So when you're thinking about engaging academic discourse, part of that is that you actually want to have students learn more about their models on how they present it, but also how they hear about it from, college, from their, their classmates. Then you want to present evidence of learning. You know, so what has the student done that they are presenting to you that there is evidence that they have actually learned from the, from the sequence of events that you've been planning? Students then need to be able to communicate reasoning through individual three-dimensional performance. So with this, you know, you may give them a, a specific task that they're actually showing that they are showing the, their knowledge that they can use three-dimensional uh, thought to actually answer questions. Uh, you know, can they talk about um, why you shouldn't put a big manufacturing plant on the shores of Crystal River in Florida? Can they talk about why the African land snail is actually a huge invasive species? Can they actually articulate why the bee population is really critical to all of us in, in our current way of life? And then finally, applying that science learning beyond the classroom. And unfortunately, this is probably one that, that we don't do enough. So how do, do you really do this to make sense of phenomena? So if a kid can kind of come back to you and tell you a lot of facts, that's great. But if they can't actually apply that learning beyond the classroom, I'm not sure what we've done. Now, what I want to share with you is these are the eight steps. Now, what SREB has also done is we, we've put this into how, what would we expect to see? What would be the teacher behaviors, the student behaviors, and what might be artifacts of how this works? So when you're making sense of phenomena, teachers should be select, uh, they should select and present relevant phenomena that motivate students to make sense of their, uh, of the causes of the phenomena. In other words, it needs to be something the kids are going to care about. Don't have them calculate, you know, if you go tell them to go to the top of the gym, drop a basketball, and calculate how high it bounces each time. Kids probably don't care about that so much. They might care about, you know, the bee population. They may care about, you know, something in your agriculture. So the teacher behaviors, you need to select really good relevant phenomena for the students. <clears throat> A student behavior, they should carefully observe the phenomena and develop preliminary explanations and solutions. It's okay if they're not right at this point. In fact, you want them to learn from it. So some artifacts from this might be some type of oral or written preliminary explanations. Again, uh, I know my own son, he uses, uh, he has what he calls the CER folders. He introduces a phenomena at the beginning of every unit. And then he has kids go back every three days and pick up their notebook that they just keep in their in his classroom. And they, they adjust their CER or their claim based on new evidence and new reasoning. What about developing questions? Well, the teacher needs to be able to use instruction strategies that really engage students in developing useful questions. That's key. We've got to teach that. The student behavior is that they develop the questions in researching information. Again, this is about the student developing question, not about the teacher. So the artifact, uh, what type of, of uh, things would we expect to see? Again, written questions and discussions. Uh, and that discussion part's important. This isn't just about what I'm going to turn in. This is actually about what we want to hear from them. So, and we want to really pay attention to are the questions, uh, 
most useful to generate empirical evidence. If they don't do that, then we have to question the questions. Gathering data. The teacher behavior is that they develop uh, or select coherent series of three-dimensional student performances that direct the gathering of relevant and accurate data. In other words, we can't think about doing single labs anymore. I mean, you, obviously there are times that may be appropriate, but you want ultimately everything to kind of come back to that original phenomenon. So you want to have that big picture phenomena, and then you can have a series of smaller phenomena that ultimately relate back. That's one of the ways you get to that last part of being able to extend beyond the classroom. The student behavior, working collaboratively to gather data. We had a great teacher. Actually, she, she's an employee at NSTA now, Trish Shelton. What she used to do is she would have groups of kids collect data and then tweet their data tables so that they could share their data not only with students in their own class, but with students in their other classes. So working collaboratively to do that is really important. The artifacts are pretty obvious. Data tables, charts, models, all that kind of thing is important. Now, I will point out one thing. Notice under teacher behaviors in this box, there are some deliberate connections to the powerful math instructional practices that the SREB uses um, because this is a, a really powerful overlap with, with math. In reasoning how evidence supports, um, we really want to see uh, teachers be able to create a coherent series of student three-dimensional performances that engage students in analyzing data for the purpose of engaging their students in reasoning of evidence-based explanations for the causes of phenomena. What do students do? They're going to analyze that data and they're going to use everything from cause and effect to uh, patterns to be able to uh, come up with reasoned explanations that are supported by their evidence. And of course, the artifacts, again, ex uh, some type of written or oral explanation, arguments, graphs, models, all sorts of things. And again, here in the teacher behavior, this is actually where you can make some great connections to both math and literacy. And then engaging in academic discourse. Um, you can certainly think about the teacher behaviors uh, of how uh, we want to engage them in them. Now, we're not talking about we want kids to line up and charge one another, but having a good academic argument is actually a great thing. But you've got to plan it. So you want to engage students in small group discourse. You want to have them work in pairs or even in groups. Uh, you want them to use the questions and prompts, to, uh, or I'm sorry, you want to develop, um, especially early in the learning cycle, um, questions that can prompt uh, a great conversation. Eventually, you want the students to be able to do that, but you may have to give them a little bit of help first to, to really help them, prompt them into what type of conversations to have. You want to use the cross-cutting concepts to focus student reasoning and responses. Again, like I told you earlier, the cross-cutting concepts, those are the objective lens. That's how you can help them focus. The student behaviors, they should be communicating their reasoning. They should be able to use models and speaking and writing and all sorts of things to support this academic discourse. Uh, the artifacts, again, are, are pretty standard, uh, but you want to um, also see how they can respond to other people's explanations and arguments. Um, so this can be formal or informal, but you want to um, see how the, what the evidence they've gathered either supports or refutes their own explanations. Again, this is a great way to connect to literacy. Stephen, I don't. Yeah. This is the voice of Kelly. <laughs> I don't, I don't think your your presentation <laughs> is not on. So I think you just got to collect. Click on that present on off button again. Okay. Well, it says present. Oh, okay. It clicked on. My bad, gang. So have you not seen any of this? No. And I thought we. I was like, wait a. Well, dang, y'all, I am so sorry. I, I uh, thought I, this is, I guess, part of the problem. I went into it and I can't see anything else. So I, here's what I'll do. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all that to you again, but I'm going to show you. Uh, this is the cycle. Thank you for breaking in and telling me, Kelly. Um, part of the problem, I think, is I can't see. Um, I can't always see where this is actually working, so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Christine, for telling me I, I uh, explained it well. <laughs> All 
right, so just to make sure, uh, I think you can see this now. Um, so these are the eight steps. We have these in grids of teacher behavior, student behaviors, and artifacts. And the, the um, you know, talking about presenting evidence of learning, I'm just going to pick up there. Uh, and I'm happy to share this presentation so you can go back and take a look at it later. Uh, teacher behavior for evidence of learning, they should use both formal and informal formative assessments. Um, this doesn't have to be where you stop, drop, and test. Uh, th this should be things that you're having in conversations, tickets out the door, all those things that we've been taught to use. Um, but it means that we're a little bit more focused on how we're paying attention to it. The student behavior is that they present their evidence of learning to themselves and to others. Um, it means that they actually provide appropriate feedback to others as well as reflecting on the feedback that they receive from others. Uh, the oral, the artifacts, of course, are, again, oral written presentations uh, and a number of other types of ideas. Communicating the reasoning is actually about uh, the fundamental uh, communication of how they arrived at where they are. So the teacher actually needs to uh, use their instructional strategy to create opportunities for students to communicate. Now, this takes time. Now, I want to hear, I want, I want to be clear. I've heard this for a long time, ever since I started working in science education years ago, and especially once we started on the framework in GSS. I heard people say, oh, I don't have time to this. I've got to get through this so I can get to, this, to the state test. Folks, let me just tell you, having done this before myself, maybe not exactly in the way that we are showing it in the framework, but I, I actually don't see how you don't have time to do it. The reality is you buy more time by allowing kids to engage in this kind of work. And the, the communicating part does take time, but the benefit of, of the depth of learning that they get is, is really, you can't beat that. So the formal assessment is generally the part, um, uh, formal assessment is generally part of the communicating reasoning phase. Uh, so this is, you know, a, a part that, that you, you're not, we're not saying you get rid of all your tests. And we're not saying that you go to everything just being verbal, but it is part of communicating the reasoning. But what that also means is when you do your formal assessment, if it's just multiple choice and there's no 3D, you're not really getting there. You've got to still have kids engaging in three-dimensional performance. Even if that is that they, on their, their test, they are somehow creating a thought model or they're creating some type of thought experiment. The student behavior, here is they're going to be communicating what that scientific reasoning is, which means they're bringing all three dimensions together to explain a, a task or to explain a phenomena that you presented them. The artifacts, again, are written or oral responses to your assessments, uh, but again, you've got to redesign these. If you're just going to use something that comes out of a, out of a textbook or, or something online that, that just simply is which of the following is anaphase, you're not really going to get the kids there. In fact, they're going to struggle even more on the state assessment simply because they are, they're working on memorization. This gives kids ownership of what they know and allows them to learn it in a deeper way because they can actually explain it to everybody. I don't know about you guys. I learned a lot more chemistry, even though I have a degree in chemistry. I actually have two degrees in chemistry. I learned a lot more when I taught it than I did when I was sitting in class as far as being able to get into the depth. And this is really what that's getting to. The last phase. Uh, the last step is about applying that knowledge beyond the classroom. So you want to allow students establish really some clear expectations and use your instructional strategies to motivate students to investigate phenomena beyond the classroom. So you want the kids to, to start actively looking for phenomena outside of what they're learning. The behavior is that they should be able to apply this given a new situation. Often they actually find. Um, you can give them some certainly some, some ideas, but let them be the ones that are going to question. Let them be the ones that are going to find those phenomena. Logs and journals and lists of phenomena that have been encountered over time are actually great ways to think about this. Have kids keep a journal where they actually actively look for um, you know, whatever uh, content you're looking at at the time. If you're really wanting them to think about ecosystems, 
that have them keep a journal over certain phenomena they see about how organisms are surviving in their backyard or even in, in a, a, a balcony uh, garden. Um, have them really think through all of that stuff. So I know I have just a little bit of time left, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. But some of you have even seen this before. You may have even seen me talk about this before. This is an old way of doing things. The engineering challenge, engineering constructed platform that supports the full mass of a bottle of water in a stable position as far above the table as you can. And the materials are two sheets of paper and one full water bottle. I've done this with adults. I've done this with students. Here's what happens. People just jump in, they start building, and they and it, and it becomes a competition because you want to see who can get it the highest above the table. Well, folks, just like if, it, if you can eat it, it's probably not a model. There's an argument that if it's just a challenge, it's probably not engineering because there's so much that goes more that goes into it. So if you think about what I showed you with our eight steps of the powerful or the eight powerful instructional practices, it may look more like this. First, engineer and construct a platform that supports the mass of the bottle in a stable position as far above the table as you can. Okay, that's the same as what I just showed you. But here's the thing. Kids need to ask, what questions must be addressed in planning the structure? Develop a model. In this case, they can use a free body diagram to show the forces that are acting on the water bottle to cause it to be stable on the tower. Those are green because we have cause and effect and stability and change, which are two cross-cutting concepts. And that's actually the focus that I want kids to have in this. After they do their work, we're going to have a group discussion. We want, I want them to use conceptual and mathematical models to communicate differences in the net forces between systems that cause the phenomena. Again, we're back to cross-cutting concepts, but look at what we've done. I've engaged them in a, in a phenomena. They are looking for questions that they can collect data on. They're going to be observing through the building of their tower, the model, and now they're they're starting to uh, use reasoning to discuss to have this classroom discussion. And then we're going to come back to an individual performance where they're going to revise the design of their tower and write an explanation for how the sum of forces acting on the water bottle uh, system are more stable. So after the conversation, they're going to come back and revise it and rebuild it. Then they're going to develop a claim evidence reasoning argument for an architectural or other phenomena like paddle boarding or surfboarding or skateboarding regarding the, the balance of multiple forces. So what that might this look like? Well, let's just say that they go through this and the kids start asking questions about, well, where is the center of mass? Does the bottle need to be completely vertical? Can it be off vertical and stable? In other words, can it be tilted? What forces are acting on a stable stationary object? So they may look at this and go, okay, so we know that the normal force needs to equal the gravitational force if it's vertical. And they can come up with an explanation that if the bottle is completely vertical, the force of gravity is equal to the normal force. Since the ends of the bottle are vertical, there's no calculation needed to properly model the balanced forces because everything is completely balanced there. But what if it is tilted? If, the, if it's tilted, then we're actually going to have to think about this because now we're adding additional res, uh, resultant forces that have to be a problem. And if we don't properly account for that, then that tower is not going to support the weight. So students can actually engage in that kind of conversation. Here they can engage with their math and be able to show how you could calculate the forces that are necessary to keep that stable. Then they could go out and they could look at a suspension bridge. Say, well, do the supports on that have to be completely vertical? What if they're not? What additional problems could that cause? What, what additional issues could that have? Paddle boarding. My wife and I have started paddle boarding. And I can tell you that if, a, if you do not have a balanced center, you will fall. You will fall great, in, in a great way and, and have lots of people laugh at you, especially if your children are present and watching you fall. But a lot of people get into this or skateboarding. They can, you can really talk about all the different forces that are acting on keeping a stable, upright position. So with that, um, I'm going to um, stop. I've, I've got a few minutes left. I'm happy to take questions. Um, again, I, uh, 
I actually, I, I really apologize for, for uh, you guys not seeing this. I'm, I'm going to kind of scroll through this just so you can see it. Um, and we can start taking questions. So uh, the value of science, integrating science with reading, uh, integrating science uh, in elementary in particular around reading, integrating science with math, a Venn diagram that shows how we can overlap things, and then the three dimensions of science. This is the GCR, uh, uh, GRC that uh, graph that I mentioned to you from that Brett Molding put together. This is what San Diego County put together for the cross-cutting concepts. This is just a schematic that shows how all these things have to be intertwined. And then we're back to the science practices. So with that, um, we'll see what kind of questions we have. Uh, so I see Annette is asking a question. Do you have the Power for Science Instruction Practice in a form that you can share? Uh, and what is the name of Brett's book? So great questions. Uh, yes, uh, actually it's on our website. So if you go to uh, sreb.org and Google um, or, and search for science instructional practices, you'll be able to see that. Um, the, uh, uh, as far as the name of Brett's book, let me show you that one more time. It's called Going 3D with GRC. Going 3D with GRC. And the, the author is Brett Molding, M-O-U-L-D-I-N-G. Let me put, I think I can. Brett's uh, place. And actually, Christine, thank you for putting up that website. Um, there's actually a 3DGRC.org uh, website uh, that has a lot of great activities, a lot of which can be done at home now that we're in this blended environment. So I would encourage you to go and take a look at that. He actually has asterisks by each of the, the uh, phenomena that can actually be used at home without having to be used in the um, in the actual classroom. Happy to take other questions. Maybe, I don't know if we're allowing people to unmute it or not, but um, happy to take a question verbally or take another question on, um, on the, again, I apologize for not having uh, the, my presentation on earlier. That's all right. Um, it kind of goes with the theme of the day, little glitches here and there. So just a quick question, though, for you, Stephen. Um, so one of the things that came up, because there's been a lot of talk about the COVID-19 stuff. Yeah. Um, and the question that came up was that, you know, schools and districts want to teach on the COVID-19 how does that lie within the NGSS? How do we, you know, some were saying there was a discussion around, well, does it really fall within like so-called health standards, that sort of thing? Yes, there's a lot of biology and things like that, but I thought if you could just talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, sure. Um, so <clears throat> to me, um, I mean, it's a whole lot easier in my opinion to teach uh, the framework in GSS type things in science in this environment than it was, than it would be to teach the more traditional. Um, certainly you've got a lot of opportunity with biology, talking about everything from viral um, to infection to uh, contact tracing and all that. But I mean, there's all a whole lot of other aspects that you could, you could use with, with this. One of the things I think about is, um, you know, if I was teaching physics, one of the things we know about COVID is that it's actually um, uh, transmitted through moisture droplets. So the reason why we, we do six feet is actually to, to try to mitigate as much of that risk as part possible. But the reality is if you sneeze and there's nothing to, to capture that, uh, you can actually have water droplets that go 26 feet. 
Well, that actually would be a pretty interesting projectile motion type activity to think about in physics. Um, and, uh, you know, in chemistry, I mean, the, the whole idea around the biochemical nature of, of what's being done to either do the testing, to think about vaccines, to think about, you know, all those different aspects. I mean, really COVID, I think, does give us a lot of opportunity. And certainly it's going to be a, a phenomena that I think kids are going to be interested in. Now, let's be honest. There's also going to be some of those folks that are uh, going to be um, <laughs> really uh, against that because, the, you know, some of the uh, our, our uh, citizenry does not really understand how uh, dangerous COVID has become. But this could also be a kind of a low stress way to, to get, start getting ki kids in particular to start thinking about the different aspects that, that affect not just this, but it could be other infections and, and other issues as well. Um, yes, I'm gonna send Kelly the slides. I uh, just saw that as a question. Kelly, did that kind of answer your question? Is that what you were going for? It was, I, you know, I think that it's, it's really helpful right now. And I think there's just a lot of questions about it and teachers wanting to be able to incorporate it into their lessons. And they're just kind of like, but does this align and how do I do that? And, um, and so I think giving us ways to think about that is really helpful. And, you know, that's what you were kind of showing today, that instructional lens as well. Yeah. And I mean, and, and with COVID, I think the, the, the real, um, there's a real opportunity here for, for people to bring this into the classroom, use it as a phenomena. But I mean, think about the cross-cutting concepts here. I mean, I mean, you can really get into scale, proportion, and quantity. As you can talk about, you know, if you do have the projectile that can go 26 feet after a sneeze, I mean, you can look at the th thrust vector for that. You can look at, at you know, the trajectory itself. Um, I mean, so that's actually a physics aspect of it. Um, but you can really get into this sort of um, uh, discussion with kids. And again, I think you do it based on the, the cross-cutting concepts as much as anything to help them get focus on, on what things are. I mean, certainly you can look at the analysis of new cases per day, you, can, you know, all that kind of thing. I think the biggest thing that I would be, that I would um, be careful about is that you don't use it as your own uh, agenda uh, necessarily in terms of politics. Uh, you, you actually, and you also don't approach it completely from a doom and gloom kind of perspective. Um, I mean, it's scary enough for people. And I think the thing I would just caution everybody on is, remember our students are coming back and, and we always have students who are, who have had, who have, are dealing with trauma. But we have seen trauma, I believe, on, on an unparalleled scale here. Where students who traditionally may not have had a whole lot of trauma, they have. We've had them worry about their parents losing their jobs. We've had uh, the fear itself of getting COVID-19. We've had, you know, all those different aspects. And so I think in using COVID in science class and in our STEM work, I think is, is a great opportunity. But I also think you got to be careful. Um, you've got to be aware of who's in your classroom. You've got to be aware of the social and emotional needs of the kids in your classroom. Because, gang, I, I got to tell you that that's that's probably the part that scares me the most and, and concerns me the most is that uh, we don't uh, we in education we've not always stopped and thought about the importance of of the social and emotional aspect we kind of just dive into the content. And I believe we're in a time where if we don't deal with that, I'm not sure how much other content we can learn regardless of the content area. I think you really bring up a very valid point. It's kind of, you know, when we get back to the classroom, I think there's so much anxiety out there around the fact that we, kids have lost some learning, right, along the way. And so now all of a sudden we go back you can't just jump right back into it. I think there has to be a little bit of a pause moment to really check on that social, emotional, the well-being of the child. So there, you're absolutely right. There's just a lot that's been going on there. 
Um, just one other thing I just wanted you to comment on um, just briefly here, just in terms of your work with SREB and you're dealing with all of the states and everything, um, you know, especially thinking about this blended learning model going back and going forward. Do you have any words of advice or just comments that you could um, make that you're seeing some best practice models that are out there? I mean, we saw reports that the remote learning wasn't working, but we've heard from a lot of there's pockets. So I don't want to say it's blanket that it's not working. There are pockets, but would just love any insight that you have on that. Yeah, happy to do that. So first of all, um, and, and I see where Annette just talked about lost learning. And, and I, I, Annette, I, I want to tell you how profound that is. I think that's a great point. First of all, what, what I'm hearing people talk about is um, – you know, I hear people talk about using priority standards or power standards and looking at what, and, and folks, the way to really deal with this is acceleration. And, and so in thinking about how do we support students, it really is about accelerating their knowledge. And that's where phenomena can be, come in. And we, if we approach it from a diagnostic mindset, that doesn't mean we're testing the heck out of everybody. It means that we're paying attention to what deficiencies kids might have. And they're going to have that whether COVID had happened or not. So we look at it from the standpoint of acceleration. Remediation doesn't work. It has never worked. There's never been any support for it works. We know that worksheets don't grow dendrites. So none of that's going to work. <laughs> so, um, so that's one aspect. Kelly, specific to, th we have seen where there are, have been some school districts who have done a, a bang up job with remote learning. But here's what we learned from them. The best practice is number one, they have equity as the number one priority. So they, mm -hmm. they, they yeah. make plans for the students who don't have access either because they don't have broadband or because they don't have um, uh, actual devices. They have a plan for how they will never allow a child to become invisible. And what I mean by that is that they don't have children that disappear and people don't hear from them for days or weeks at a time. They are using engaging work um, digitally that, that, can be done at home that also provides parents with some um, how to and how to help people think, how to help parents think about how to help their kids. And the number one thing, Kelly, um, that we've learned from all this is communication is the most important aspect to everything that's going on, both with the parents and the students and within the faculty. Um, that, you know, you communicate, communicate, communicate some more. And when you think you communicate as much as you can, you communicate it eight more times. Um, right. it's, it's, it's really a big, big deal. Um, but I do think, and I just want to go back and reiterate one more time, equity has got to be the main focus. Equity of access, equity of ensuring that each child has the opportunity to, to become the best version of themselves. And that's true whether we're talking about COVID, blended learning, virtual learning, or whatever. But in this time, we've got to redouble our efforts and refocus on ensuring that each child has the opportunity. And realize it may not look the same. Equity doesn't mean it yeah. looks the same. It means that, you know, you're having it. So, uh, you know, if a kid can't get on the computer until 6 o'clock in the evening because their two brothers had the computer before they got to it, we got to know that's okay. Uh, and we have to give that child the same kind of support that we would everybody else. Yeah, I agree. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. I mean, it's always a pleasure. And you're going to have a chat session tomorrow as well, along, you know, with Christina and Geraldine, too. I mean, everybody that you've been hearing from. This is what it's all about today. Today is about learning those best practices, sharing with one another, and really starting to see the work happen, know where we can get resources. And I think the most important thing is knowing that we're not in this alone, that there's a lot of people there that we can draw connections with. Um, with. And if we do that, then we get to that lens of equity there because we're not trying to make it one size fits all. And there's so much learning that's out there. So, Thank you, Stephen. It's always a pleasure. So giving you the applause. And I, you saw lots of thumbs up that were there, too, which we love. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Great talking to everybody. If anybody needs any, uh, has any more questions, feel free to email me uh, at stephen.pruitt at sreb.org or, or tweet me. 
and happy to do that. And I'm going to send you that PowerPoint right now, Kelly, so we can get that posted since I did not click the right button, apparently. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Thank you. Thank you. Trust me, we've had Thank our fair you. share of technology problems. So so now for everyone, we have a lunch break um, here. And so our lunch, we're going to start right back at one o'clock and we're going to be uh, hearing from the STEM Happens Network team. Um, and they're going to talk a little bit about this blended learning model here. So I want to encourage everyone at this time Take a little bit of a break, whether it's uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, whatever it may be. But I also encourage you to jump into the lounge um, and please, you know, make some new friends and visit uh, there. So anyways, time to have a little bit of a stretch break. So we'll be back um, in about, well, exactly 30 minutes. So thank you. <laughs> 